Welcome to the AlphaList podcast. I am your host, Toby. AlphaList is a closed community with over 600 CDOs who share their knowledge and experience in a Slack space and at events. With this podcast, we want to give our members and interested parties insights into the thoughts and ideas of top CDOs. If you're interested in becoming a member of the community, please visit alphalist.com to find out more on how to apply. This podcast is proudly presented by Moss. Moss is the all-in-one solution for company expenses. With Moss, companies manage all expenses in one place from anywhere. The powerful Moss credit cards are ideal for high cloud costs. Moss offers card limits of up to half a million euros and payment terms of up to 60 days. This helps you to optimize your cash flow. Save time and money with Moss. Manage incoming invoices digitally and set your accounting on autopilot. All receipts are automatically pre-accounted. Your accounting data can be exported directly to DATEV. This way, your month-end closing is done in just a few minutes. Additionally, you get 0.4% cashback on every payment. Stay on top of all expenses and use Moss free of charge for two months with the coupon code ALPHA. For more information, visit getmoss.com slash alpha. Get moss.com slash alpha. So, welcome to the Alphalist podcast. Um, this is actually the first post pandemic physical podcast like um i'm in denmark and um over here it's uh, like everything got way more simple to to meet again and i'm sitting in a room with one of, one of my favorite guests from the past david heinemeyer hansen um he's i think an idol of a lot of programmers out there and founders out there and um he initiated rails ruby on rails he's founder of basecamp and hey.com he's a book author And yeah, I, I heavily admire him for years already. And um, he has very strong opinions, sometimes also uses very strong language to express them. Um, and today we're talking about his experience from bootstrapping at Basecamp and the future of frameworks and web development. And one little challenge for listeners. So if you can count the F words, um, Everyone who sends me the correct count will get a little surprise. David, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Was that a good introduction? Yeah, that's good. Although now you've, of course, given me a challenge not to use any F-bombs at all. <laughs> 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 we'll see if I can uh, I can stay within the line. Probably not. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So um, there's a topic I'd like to touch. So you're, you're back in Denmark. Um, you, you used to live in Copenhagen. Uh, sorry. You li used to live in, in Chicago. Um, and you're doing the remote thing now or what, like, why did you move back? Yeah. So I've actually done the remote thing for the entirety of my adult life. Um, my entirety of my career, basically for the past 20 years, I've worked remotely from first from Copenhagen, then from Chicago, then from Spain, then from Malibu. I've lived in a bunch of different places. And during that entire time, even when I lived in Chicago, where Basecamp had an office for many years, I worked remotely because remote work is simply the form and style of work that suits me. I do the bulk of my deep creative thinking in my own space where I can close the door. And I found that it simply does not work for me to be in an open office or any traditional office environment. So I've worked remotely my entire career, which have given me the opportunity to live where I want to live because that's a great place to live, not because it's near to an office. And when the pandemic started, um, we were living in Malibu and uh, spent about five months in lockdown and homeschooling. And made it through that better than many others because I could work from home and it wasn't a novel thing that I was being thrust into, but it wasn't a great way to live. It wasn't a great thing for our kids that they had to endure homeschooling. And after five months and the prospects of that going on for maybe another five months, maybe another year, who knows, 
we decided, you know what, now is a good time to go somewhere else where the kids can get back to school and enjoy a more normal existence. And it just so happened that um, Denmark was one of those places. Denmark locked down the schools for a few months, uh, right around the start of the pandemic, and then got back to um, in-person education before the summer break of 2020. And obviously, I have a relation to, to Denmark, given the fact that I am Danish. My kids have Danish passports, and it just seemed like an obvious thing for us to try. If we were going to homeschool anyway, why not just try to go to Copenhagen, see what it's like, get the kids into school, in-person education, without masks and all the other stuff, and um, and see how we liked it. And we ended up thinking, you know what, this is just going to be a six-month little trip, and then the U.S. is going to go back to quote-unquote normal, and that just didn't happen. The U.S. still isn't back to anything I would call normal. Kids are still masked in schools. And when we had been here for some time and we compared the experience that our kids in particular have at school, not just the kids, it's us too. It's, it's sort of the experience of living in a society that's made some very different choices from those made in the U.S. We went like, you know what? Right here is good right now. And as I said, my work barely skipped the beat. I've been used to this. I've been used to working not just remotely, but in on different continents, in different time zones, and the coordination between all of that. And Basecamp is the product for that. That's the other thing, of course, is that our um, life's work at Basecamp is making Basecamp a toolkit that is uniquely suited for this style of collaboration. With asynchronous communication, we write things up, we commit them to Basecamp. This is where we find... Um, all the stuff we need to to work on. So it just all kind of came together and made sense. Interesting. And I just recently um, started listening to your book, uh, Remote Again. Um, and uh, like, it, it's funny. I mean, you wrote it in 2014 or something? 2013 was when it was published, yes. Okay. And it, like a lot of topics that, that happened uh, during the pandemic, like the the typical feeling that you have as a boss if your people start working from home and the, the the skeptic thoughts, is everyone productive or not? It kind of, I, I felt that this really like happened for me as well a little bit. Um, but a lot of the, 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 the topics you talk about just happened and just exploded literally. Um, that's, that's so funny. Yeah, we were basically seven or eight years too early with that book. I remember when we published uh, Remote, I thought we were late because we'd already been living this remote lifestyle for 10 years. And I couldn't personally imagine any other way of working. Um, so I thought, you know what, we're writing out the obvious. But the impetus to writing remote back in 2013 was actually a series of conversations I had with other um, starters and entrepreneurs who all followed the same path as everyone just went through with the pandemic. Whenever I would talk about us working remotely, they'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's because you're this weird company. That's because you're this weird person and somehow you can make it work. And that was how they conceptualized it in their brain, why they didn't have to think about it, why it applied to them, because they would just prop up these excuses. No, no, it couldn't work for us because, I mean, if if people don't come into the office, how do I know they're working? How do I know that they're not just on their couch PlayStation? Um, all these uh, excuses that the majority of bosses felt when the pandemic struck and they had to let people work remotely. Um, we tackled seven years ago from experience, not from, hey, this is what we imagine might happen if people start working from remote. No, we've been working remotely for 10 years. We've worked with a lot of different people over the time. We've seen the patterns of what work and what doesn't. And your fears are not just um, not founded. They're, they're the opposite of what you should fear. For example, Will people goof off if they have to work from home? No. If you have a place of work where people are doing um, interesting uh, work and you have a, a, a nice environment around it, your odds of underwork are so much less than your odds of overwork that the main thing you have to be on alert about is that people work too much because it's too hard to create the separation between when am I mm, at work and mm, when am I at home. Mm, mm. And that's where the bulk of your interventions need to come. They need to be following up with people who work too much, which is 180 degrees the opposite of what most bosses think they have to worry about. 
Yeah, um, I think also that the tools kind of are slowly adopting there that you that you're supported to switch off, right? Um, I mean, let's 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 take Slack as an example, um, where you have like a lot of notifications, you have a lot of um, distraction from your work um, and from your from your like concentrated focus time. Um, but now with like newer macOS versions, you can switch on focus mode. You can um, essentially send also voice messages and video messages, asynchronous stuff via Slack, and it kind of develops like just nicely towards the the right direction, I think. I mean, it's not yet there, um, but it's kind of developing towards that direction. Yeah, what's funny I, I about guess that- I you're not a fan of that, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the funny thing. So um, what, about 10 years before Slack was Slack, we essentially created um, Slack in the form of Campfire in 2005, I think it was. Um, and had also, by the time Slack took off, we had been using chat as a way of collaborating inside of Basecamp for many, many years. And it was so interesting to see that initial just exuberance. Oh, this is amazing. We have this uh, uh, chat channel and we can just throw things in when we have to. This is just so great. We went through the same thing. And for several years after we created Campfire, we were really excited about that. But then over time, you start seeing the negative effects of that, of this hamster wheel of information that goes by. And if you're not constantly keeping an eye on it and you miss a opportunity to give your say in an important conversation, you missed it. It's gone. It's scrolled off. And it's interlaced with five other discussions about current topic uh, in the world, with work things. And it turns out that it's, it's kind of a conveyor belt of stress in a way that's deeply counter to all these principles of what I like about remote work the ability to have long stretches of uninterrupted time. Um, organizations that adopt Slack and tools like it as the main focus of communication, as their main uh, sort of bandwidth of, of collaborating, I think in certain cases end up doing tremendous harm to their organization. And they think they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. They thought like, hey, we're going remote. The pandemic is on. What do we need to do? We need two things. We need Slack. We need Zoom. And while both of those have their places, there are also deeply pathological ways of collaborating. Um, Zoom fatigue became sort of something everyone experienced. They're like, oh, actually, yes, we can have these synchronous meetings that are sort of kind of like when we met in person, but they're not the same thing. They make us tired in a spiritual way that someone might be able to brave five hours of meetings in an office because at least you're sitting close to other humans and you have that relation. You try to do the same thing on Zoom and you just end up completely songed out. Um, and the same thing with Slack. You, you think like, oh, wow, um, we don't need the water cooler anymore. We don't need the whiteboard anymore because we can just do it all in Slack. And then you realize, do you know what? It's just a constant peppering of interruptions in our day. And why aren't people happy? Why aren't they happy? We gave them Slack. We gave them Zoom. And like, they're not particularly content about the ways they're working. These were things we had already experienced like 10 years prior. This was why we changed away from uh, our version of Slack Campfire early on. We made it a feature. We downplayed that feature of Basecamp, and we focused on the other things that are far more important, like asynchronous communication, like writing, like things where you don't require people to be in the same time and place, virtual place, mm -hmm. to be able to, to do these things. Um, and it was just, in one way, it was exciting to see everyone subjected to this new experiment of remote work and everyone was forced to actually tackle with it and realize, of course, it could work. And we dispelled the argument we were having before, is this even possible? Can large corporations work remotely? And the answer was a resounding yes. But it was also a little depressing to see everyone go through the same mistakes as we had gone through many, many years ago. We had written about, we had advocated for, um, but hey, that's sometimes the way the world works. And I think also sometimes you, you have to hit those things to realize what's good and what's not good. You have to actually experience Zoom fatigue to even have an opening in your brain to think about, do you know what? Maybe we just shouldn't have so many meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, would you say like the future is asynchronous then? I'd say the future is more asynchronous than it is synchronous, that we use asynchronous communication. We write things in Basecamp. We post things as uh, to-dos. We do all these things where whenever someone reads it, it's not that important. 
Because uh, one of the other fundamental principles that we wrote about in Rework is that ASAP is poison. This idea that you need an immediate response um, is, is poison. It ties people to constantly pay attention to these conveyor belts of communication like a Slack channel is, which destroys your ability to do the concerted work where you need two, three, four hours of uninterrupted time to, to do it. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a place. And that's, I think, sometimes comes up in these discussions. Oh, you don't like Zoom. That means we can never use that. Of course you can. You should. At Basecamp, we use Zoom or, or something like it um, on, on a weekly basis. It's just not my whole day. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't want to continue working if it was my whole day. That sounds absolutely miserable. And the same thing with Slack um, or chat tools, that chat tools absolutely have a place. And we use them as well. But it's a minority part of the slice. Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, it's 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 interesting to see. Like uh, yesterday, went out the office before I drove here, and saw so many people sitting in front of their screens, and just looking at, yeah, a lot of other people on the other side, potentially also sitting in the office. Like, how will the future of offices look like? Do you have an idea of that? I mean, does it make any sense to have an office? Does it make sense to have like small phone booths where everyone can can focus on on, on virtual meetings then? Or what would you say? And maybe like an espresso maker or something that you can, I don't know, meet as well? Yeah, well, I think one of the unfortunate um, consequences of having an office is that you restrict your workforce to having to live within the commute distance of that office, which is... As someone who've worked remotely and hired remotely for 20 years, an absolutely insufferable restriction on the availability of talent. If we could only hire people at Basecamp who live within, what, 30 or 40 minutes commute of Chicago, how many people would we have left? Very few. The vast majority of people we've hired, we've hired from somewhere not within a commute distance of Chicago because they were simply great at what they did. So when I look at the total um, number of people who potentially could apply and get a job at Basecamp, we're looking at what, six, 700 million? If you take most of uh, Western Europe, even parts of Africa, you take uh, North and South America, we've just access to a, an enormous talent pool. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, taking the truly global perspective, even if you take a perspective within a single country, you take uh, Germany, for example, what, 80 million people or something like that. But if you have your office somewhere uh, in a particular city then what, you have access to maybe a million people, maybe two million people? That seems like a, a severe constriction of your ability to hire the best people wherever they are. And it also sets up this um, unfortunate dynamic where if the, the, a person who works for you suddenly have to move, perhaps because their spouse gets a job somewhere else, or they simply want to be near family because they have a growing uh, family of their own, or any other of the reasons of life that would force us to work, you have to quit. Mm. What? Mm. So I've lived in, in, in Denmark. I've lived in Spain. I've lived multiple places in the U.S. Should I have had to quit my job every single time I moved? That seems preposterous to me. So I think the fact that while there are benefits to meeting in person, and I'm a big believer in them, we are actually doing our first meetup in two and a half years in, in March in Miami. Um, and I can't wait. To see everyone again yeah, after yeah. so long apart. Yeah. Um, those kinds of human connections are possible without an office. You can rotate these things. You can do these kinds of meetups. And I think the big insight that we had was that the difference in terms of establishing those human connections and replenishing them um, from seeing someone every week in an office to seeing them perhaps just twice a year is much smaller than people think. That if you can't just see your coworkers two or three times a year, perhaps. That's enough for a lot of people in a lot of circumstances. Um, so I don't foresee us ever having an office again mm. at Basecamp. We mm. had an office for a long time. It mm. was very underused, even for the people who had access to that office because they happened to live in the same city. Um, and I also respect that for some people, do you know what? That's what they want. They want to be in an office every day and they are just energized in that way and they don't feel like the alternatives like going to a coffee shop or a co-location space fully provide the alternative. Hey, that's good too. There's room for that as well. But I think if you look at the whole, more people are going to be like, do you know what? There's no effing way I'm going back to five days a week, 
in an office from eight to five. Yeah. Maybe it makes sense for like a larger company to have offices in like a few spots in the world and um, like just don't make it mandatory, right? Um, yes. So that you can just hang out there and maybe have like those small boxes where you can sit in, like <laughs> yes. the pre-matrix things. Um, <laughs> Which, I mean, we had those as well in the in the Chicago office, um, but it, it was clear that the people we had in Chicago, they voted with their feet, mm. that it was nicer for them in most cases to work from home. Now, that's the other thing about the pandemic that's worth remembering, that working remotely during the pandemic It's not the same as working remotely. Having to work during a lockdown with kids at home, with a spouse at home too, that's a very different set of circumstances than most people who worked for base camp remotely for many, many years, that they had the ability to um, use that space in, in a better way that worked for them because their kids were in school or they could go to a coffee shop when they needed to mix it up a bit. Um, But yeah, for me, it's clear there's no way we're ever going back. We're having an office that everyone has to go to every day of the week is returning as the dominant way people yeah. work in the future. Yeah, I think you can't enforce it, right? You, sh you shouldn't force people to go to the office. That's like also my takeaway. You can have an office and it's nice. Yes. You can, I don't know, have rotating desks there and stuff like that. So that people actually meet. And and yeah. I mean, it's also like a marketplace, like an office is a marketplace. So what are the marketplaces you you use to meet to, to, to meet new people uh, in your life, right? Is it I, is it Twitter? Is it Facebook? I don't know. Oh, I hope not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Me neither. I think that that is the other part of it is that where the pandemic was this unique moment, forcing uh, a bunch of people, especially people who didn't have lived with a family who perhaps just lived by themselves to work remotely and cut them off from all other forms of human interaction created a mass overhang of mental challenges that a lot of people dealt with very poorly. Mm. And that's not the, the new world we're going into, that you can work remotely and still also socialize with other humans. I think that's just a basic human need that if you sit in your... Uh, room or your apartment all day long, you start by being online with your coworkers and then you end the day being online, fighting and shouting at people on Twitter or Facebook. That sounds like a special version of hell. Mm -hmm. So um, talking about uh, Basecamp, um, I wanted to like briefly touch um, your, your history and experience as someone who did bootstrap actually and um it's like in the indie hacking scene um if you would now now like hit reset and you had like two hundred thousand dollars no job no base camp what would you do in 2022 the funny thing is i don't think things have actually changed that much if they've changed it's because they've gotten better when we started base camp in 2003 um Basic things like charging a credit card were surprisingly complicated. You meet, needed your own merchant account. You needed to convince a bank that you were uh, an upstanding company and they would look at like, what is this software as a service thing? I mean, it wasn't even a term back then. But you look at it today, all the affordances we have to starting a new business, start accepting credit cards, selling something, they're so much better than they were in 2003. And in 2003, we were able to do that with 10 hours a week in terms of programming time. That was the amount of time I had available to work on Basecamp. And then the designers at Basecamp treated it as like a side project to, to start with. Um, and we were able to, to build a great business that started as a small seed and then over time grew into something better um, and bigger. And I think that those opportunities are better today than they were then. So I don't need more. I could get by with less. I think we have more productive tools if you use them right and you pick them well than we had back then. And um, there's more of an acceptance that if you can identify a problem area of business in particular, but also on the consumer side, um, it's never been easier to get started and to build something. Now, That doesn't mean it's easy to be a success. It was never easy to be a success. Not in 2003, not in 2022, not in any time in between. Most businesses fail. Um, but your odds have improved. Your odds have improved of getting going and building something. And the barriers to doing all those things have just come crashing down. So if I were to start over again, I would um, I'd probably pick something similar. Working in, in small, medium-sized business area, 
allows you bootstrapping in a way that does not depend on virality. It does not depend on network effects. Trying to start something where you're competing with others who have network effects, very difficult. If you want to become the next Twitter or Facebook or whatever, just thinking of how do you even bootstrap that? How do you get that going? That's a very difficult way to go. And you're not going to get very far with $200,000 and just yourself. Starting um, a commercial piece of software that solves a problem for small and medium-sized businesses, you can sign up 10 customers and you get going. You learn something. You sign up 100. Now you have something going. You sign up 1,000 and you have a business that's self-sustaining. That, to me, offers a degree of freedom in what do I need to get started? Who do I need to take money from? Um, Where can I go with this that is unrivaled, in my opinion? Now, people start businesses for all sorts of reasons, not just for freedom. But for me, that was one of the absolute key ingredients as to why I wanted to start a business. I wanted not to have a boss. (laughs) And changing an actual boss for a set of bosses um, that became my bosses because they gave us money was not very appealing either. So long been a proponent of the fact that as you look at like, hey, I want to start my own business, first interrogate why. Do you want to start your own business because you want to change the world in some very specific way? Okay, that's one point. Do you want to start a business because you want to be your own boss and you want to call your own shots and figure that out? Like, there are different uh, choices there. And if you fall in the category of someone like me and Jason who wanted to start a business because we wanted to create great software on our own terms and set our own agenda and our own timelines, um, starting it with the maximum amount of freedom and sticking to that is a, is a great way to um, go. And that's essentially been our advocacy on entrepreneurship for the past 20 years. Because that route have had so little attention, there's been so much focus on the unicorn route. How do I raise a bunch of money so that I get a one in a thousandth chance to become the next Facebook, Twitter, whatever? Um, and I felt like, you know what? We, we need another melody playing here. We need another path that someone could hear and go like, you know what? I, that's not what I want. I don't want to run a company of 30,000. I want to run a great shop of 15, of 20, of 30, of five. These are all wonderful numbers um, in terms of how large your company is that someone should be able to embrace with pride. And that's, I think, part of the mission that we've been on is to rehabilitate the, the pride in running a small business that there's nothing wrong with running a business of 5, 10, or 15 people. It's not a stepping stone to something else. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to act bigger than you are. Embrace the fact that you're small. Embrace the fact that you have constraints. Embrace the fact that you don't have all the money in the world. And you will probably end up making unique, better software because of it. And the world needs those alternatives. So you would go for like a product-led company again? Absolutely. Start a SaaS again? Yes. I mean, part of this is because this is what I know and what I'm interested in and what I'm passionate about. Uh, I like writing software and I like writing software on all those terms of of the independence and so forth. And doing that this way, selling to small, medium sized businesses is in some ways the easiest way to do it. And I like easy. There's nothing wrong with easy. I'm not a uh, risk lover. Like there's a stereotype of entrepreneurs that like, oh, they just love risk. I found for a lot of entrepreneurs, that's not true at all. It's certainly not true for me. It's not true for for Jason. We took on zero risk to start our business. We literally started the business as a side project. There wasn't even $200,000. There was no dollars. It was something we did in more or less our spare time. We built it up on the side and we didn't put our eggs in that basket until the basket was strong enough to hold the eggs on their own terms. So we didn't give up the consulting business that we had until the product business was solid. So this is another kind of stool in our advocacy here is that this confusion that becoming an entrepreneur means having a high risk tolerance is complete nonsense. What would be your first hire? Um, That's a good question. I'd like to delay hiring as long as possible. Uh, (laughs) The more people, the more trouble. It's kind of like more money, more more trouble. Certainly more people, more trouble. Um, This is one of the other misnomers that a lot of entrepreneurs think, oh, it's so hard to start a business. Fuck no, it's not. It's not hard to start a business. It's hard to stay in business. And it only gets harder the longer you go. The more people you have, the more customers you have, the more complications. And in many ways, those complications are 
contrary to the things that you probably enjoy the most. It certainly was in our case. I spend a lot more of my time dealing with um, a large company versus the time I spent dealing with a small company. That the freedom of having fewer customers, having fewer people around is immensely satisfying, but most entrepreneurs don't realize until they look in the rearview mirror. Because there's this natural drive where we think bigger is better. The, the more revenue you have, the more customers you have, the more people you have, it is better, right? Like I'm more of a success and therefore I should be happier. And that creates this cognitive dissonance when you realize, oh, I'm not. I'm not actually happier necessarily running a company of 50 people or 500 than I was running a company of five. And these are some of the cruel ironies of business that having success um, is not a uniform blessing. There are all sorts of drawbacks to it. So I would delay having to deal with all of that for as long as possible. And I would try to find ways that we could uh, stay in the, in the sweet spot of a small group for as long as possible. Now, maybe some of that is just nostalgia and I'm not remembering all the hardships well enough because it's been uh, at least uh, 20 years since we started with uh, four people. But um, that's what I would do if I, I tried again. And the funny thing about that is I've essentially targeted my entire um, advocacy, career, open source work towards that. If I had to start over, what would I want? What tools would I have want available? What ideological pinnings would I want on my side? Um, and all the work that I've done with Ruby on Rails, for example, has been under this banner of the one person framework. That I don't want to build a framework that is well suited for a company that has 20 programmers, which is actually the number of programmers thereabouts we have at Basecamp right now. So it would be natural for me to build a framework that fit that. That's what happens with a lot of technology, that it's built to fit the organization that creates it. So when Facebook builds uh, open source software, it's open source software that works for Facebook. Of course it is. But I was so fortunate to build Rails when I was just one person. So I got to place the foundation of what Rails was and where I wanted to take it in the mold of a single person. What do I need to be effective? What do I need to be able to build something real, meaningful, competitive as a single programmer? So I have these fantasies all the time of starting over and being able to build something meaningful and real with a single uh, program. And in to some extent, we get to live out that fantasy, at least for a moment, whenever we start working on something new at Basecamp. We started working on Hey.com, our new email service, a couple of years ago. And we started out with a team of three people working on that. And we took it with three people for quite a long time until there was a reasonable foundation and we knew where we wanted to go. And then we, we invited more people from the company to, to start working on it. But validating that ethos, that it is possible to create something real competitive, compelling with a tiny team, even perhaps not even a full-time team, a part-time team as a side gig is incredibly important to to me and to the work that I do in both open source and uh, entrepreneurial sort of lore and, and advocacy. You recently posted like a very like prominent job. Um, I think it, like at least I, I saw it a lot on Twitter and, and LinkedIn and so on. Um, I think you you wanted to hire like a VP of engineering for Basecamp. Is that is that correct? A, a director of engineering, yes. Okay. Um, it, which is it, what's interesting about Basecamp is that for in 2014, we had four major products. They were all doing well, but one of them was doing better than the others, and that was Basecamp. And we were faced with the choice of either rapidly growing the company at that time to do four products justice or do the weird counterintuitive thing to shrink the comp or shrink the products and shrink the number of customers we had to fit the company we already had. And in 2014, we chose that. We essentially um, stopped selling the other three products that we had, focused it all on Basecamp, um, and then stuck with that until uh, we started working on Hey.com. And it, even through that, we still stayed virtually the same size of the company. Basecamp was essentially more or less frozen in terms of the size of the organization and how it was structured from 2014 until, let's say, 2020, 2021. By intent, not because like this was as far as we could push it, but because we didn't want a bigger company. And the reason we didn't want a bigger company was exactly why we've now posted that job opening. Jason and I knew 
that once you get to about 50 people or so, you can no longer do without layers of middle management. You simply need middle managers that sit between the executive team and individual contributors to be able to to scale, to be able to uh, do the people who are working for you justice in terms of what they need in career guidance and management and all these other things. So we didn't want to get into that. And now we've taken the opposite choice because Hey came out the gates as a huge success, bigger launch that we've ever done with any product in the history of the company. We signed up more paying customers in a shorter time than anything we've ever done. And suddenly we were sitting not just with two products, but two major products. Um, Hey became a multi-million dollar business in basically five minutes after launch. And it was something we had just um, uh, incubated inside an existing company that was already very lean, we we're already running this major uh, business of Basecamp with a very lean crew. And now, poop, we have the second business that should have a, a company of a similar size or not that much short or, or smaller to run it. And we had both and we were trying to run it with this tiny lean team. That was not going to work. It was never going to work. It was never going to be a sustainable long-term path for us to do. So we could have done the same thing we did in 14 and go like, oh, shit, sorry. Didn't mean for this to be a big success. I guess uh, we're going to sell it or we're going to do something else like that. But we made the different choice. We made the choice. You know what? This time we are going to grow the company. And by making that choice, we walked in knowing, do you know what? You can't just grow the company like adding four extra programmers and and that's going to do it. No, we have to step over the threshold where we become a different company, become a different company with uh, with middle management, more leadership, all these things. And that's where the director of engineering came in that like, you know what, we have too many programmers now and too many team leads. And we have prospects of having even more of those than can report to me as the CTO. And you know what? After 20 years, it's also not my favorite thing. Like I... I don't uh, have a problem admitting my limitations of both interest and capacity. And those limitations are, I can't spend the majority of my time in one-on-ones with team leads and the other um, tasks that need to be done to run a major engineering operation. Um, I can enjoy that at at a lower level. We're not at that level anymore. You know what? We should hire someone who loves this work, who's good at it, who's interested in it, who can dedicate themselves fully to it. And then you you know what? Then I can do the things that I'm good at and uniquely talented at and so forth. And uh, that's how we came up with the director of engineering role. And that is just one of several leadership positions that um, we've opened up and that we've hired. We hired a COO um, several months ago. We've hired a head of finance. We've hired a head of legal. We've hired and, and are in the process of hiring an entire administrative side of the business that simply didn't exist for 20 years. Would you imagine that we've processed hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue over the 20 years existence that we've had? We've never had a full-time lawyer. We've never had a full-time finance person. Um, we like all these traditional parts of like, do you know what, once you grow up and become a real business, you're supposed to have, we just didn't have for 20 years th- through intent by capping what we were going to be at. We were going to be 40, 50, 60 people. That was it. We didn't want to be any bigger than that. And we stuffed that essentially full of a product organization, a customer service organization, an operations organization. And that was it. And then, I mean, a, a few things here and there. And now that realization, you can't do that anymore. If you're going to be 100 people, you need a different organization. You can't run it in the same way. You can't run it with the same methods. Um, and we walk in with that with some trepidation. I mean, once you, you're you in your groove as you were for, for 20 years, um, I think it's easy to be stuck in that. And then to some extent, we were blessed with a crisis. We were blessed with a crisis of, of April of last year um, that really shook up all these grooves we had and enabled us to see things in a different way and go like, do you know what? Maybe now is the time to try something else. Maybe the things we've we've done so far, we, we can try something else. And, and I don't think we would have come to the same realizations and we would not have put the same weight and speed behind the transformation of the organization that we're doing now if it hadn't been for that blessed crisis. How hard it may have been in the moment, um, it enabled us to, to become this new company. So I'm grateful in many ways for what we went through. And this is one of those ironies of many types of hardship that you come out on the other side of it if you dare embrace it for the positives of it as better 
as a better company, as a better person, as 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 these other um, advances you can take once you're being forced to do so. So, getting getting a little more technical, there is like a recent trend of of no code tools um, that a lot of indie hackers are attracted by. So. Let's take Airtable as an example. Would you these days, if you would start again, um, like choose Postgres or MySQL, or would you would you also go for such tools? Do you think it's it's handy, or does it explode at a certain time when you have a certain size? Um, what would be your your best guess? I mean, I guess you would use Rails again, so maybe that's not an option. Um, but if you would like try to be neutral, uh, what would you do? Well, so the funny thing is here, I'm going to betray my my age, which was I've heard of no to- code tools for like at least once every ten years. There's usually a resurgence of no code interest, and the first time I heard of that was in the in the '90s, and they were for- called uh, f- uh, fourth generation tools, and it was essentially the same thing. Oh, you don't need to learn program because we've made advances that are so meaningful that you can now create programs that you want without knowing that. Um, and it's like yes. Of course you can, within those limits. If the uh, things you care about can be codified in such a way that um, you can't tweak them, that's fine. In many ways, that's what Rails is. Rails is saying there's a whole host of um, the technical decisions that you shouldn't bother with because you don't care about them. But in my opinion, if you want to create a Basecamp or a Hey.com or any of the other products that we've been um, working on for the past 20 years, you actually do care about a lot of those details. There's a limit. I don't care about how the freaking assembler is put together. I don't care about uh, a bunch of the, the ways we name our database tables or whatever. Rails takes care of a lot of that stuff. But as soon as it gets into user land, if you will, things that change how the application works and your interface with it, I care an awful lot. And these no-code tools have never been able to bridge that gap. They've been able to take a certain domain and say, within this box, we can make things a lot faster for you. And that's great if you're inside that box. In many ways, one of the greatest no-code tools of all time was Excel. Excel is, is a, a way for non-techies to create applications inside of their organizations. And it's been phenomenally successful of that. So much of SaaS is essentially taking an Excel spreadsheet and turning it into a, a multi-tenant application. Um, so I recognize the, the value of that. Um, but I don't think it's, as of yet at least, anywhere close to the kind of tooling that I would want to work with to create the kinds of applications that that I create. So, yes, of course, I would use Rails. I mean, th- that's that's kind of given in, in this whole exercise and, and my work on Rails as this one-person framework. I'm constantly preparing for the fact that, you know what, I might have to hit reset. Most businesses eventually go out of business. And if I have to start over, what do, which tools do I want available to me? So not, um, I don't know if fan is even the wrong word. I just don't think it's, it's applicable to the kind of work that I do. It's interesting. I think it's fascinating. And it's good if it, just like Excel, brings people who weren't, didn't have the skills, uh, didn't have the capacities to create um, applications and toolkits like Ruby and Rails and opportunities to create something for themselves all the power to them. But as you can see with all the other previous waves of no code, they they don't really displace this need to create bespoke applications. This episode is proudly presented by Dell Technologies. They are a team of experts that helps you solving all your IT-related challenges and IT needs in your daily business and consult you in choosing the right end-to-end IT solutions or products. They offer IT technology solutions for companies of any size, tailored to their needs and have a huge product portfolio with IT solutions and know-how. They can help CTOs through providing end-to-end IT solutions, be it laptops, PCs, workstations, or server storage, cloud, and IoT solutions or financing. If you want to know more, please check the show notes to get a link. This episode is proudly presented by Google Cloud, and Google Cloud is personally my favorite cloud. I don't only tell you this because Google pays me money. No, I really like the Google Cloud the most. I use and like it a lot because it scales with my business case. 
It is the best cloud when it comes to data analysis. You can super easy deploy an app or a serverless function in no time. You save a lot of management costs through just using the Google Cloud native features. Google Cloud offers you the right tools and processes to develop and integrate your apps into your day-to-day -day operations. You will reach time to market in no time, reduce development costs and downtime, and get more reliability. If you outscale the App Engine application platform, the managed Kubernetes engine will help you to reach the next level. If you want to know more, register for the free English Modern Application Delivery on Google Cloud webinar on the 3rd of March from 10 to 11 a.m. CET. Just visit g.co slash app webinar to register. Interesting is that um, I, I run a company called SaaS Group and we we basically acquire um, bootstrap SaaS companies from, from the founders directly um, and, and grow them. And a lot of the companies we see, like 40 to 50% actually use Rails as framework. And it's exactly that size, right? It's exactly those those five people, which you just mentioned, um, that, that adopt Rails and also use it um, and have no reason uh, to, to choose anything else um, besides that, um, if you really look at it. I mean, if you approach a problem, maybe you see all those tools and you get distracted by that world as well, like the no-code world. Um, but if you really like go a bit deeper, then um, it's most of the time not enough to just use Airtable. And the complexity rises uh, whenever you are at a certain size, obviously. I mean, even if it's a little like Excel, um, it gets harder. I mean, Excel also gets harder if you write a business plan uh, with like 10 different tabs and even like a test tab in it. <laughs> it, it kind of reminds me of programming then. Um, yes, the ceiling is quite low. And that's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to the titans of the Ruby on Rails world like Shopify or GitHub that have proven demonstrably. Because you know what? In the early days, that was the critique against Rails as well. That like, oh yeah, it's quick to get started, but then it's going to be impossible to it's scale. It's not it. scaling. Yeah. yeah, it's not scalable, right? That um, silly meme have stuck even in face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary that you can have hundred billion dollar companies like Shopify that have thousands and thousands of programmers working on a Ruby on Rails app validate that. Like, do you know what? It does scale all the way. Um, and this is one of the things that, just like the remote argument in some ways can only be settled empirically when someone's done it. Like the pandemic forced everyone to work remotely and we went like, okay, the argument is over. Remote work <laughs> is, is applicable to virtually all forms of uh, creative endeavors and all companies that work inside of those endeavors can work remotely. They may not want to, but they can. Before the argument was like, is it even possible? Can you even run a company like this? And I think Shopify and GitHub and others of that size Closed the argument on like, well, maybe Rails won't scale if you get to a certain size because they got to the highest size. Um, so that has validated that the one person framework can take you as our tagline now goes on the website all the way from hello world to IPO. But if you are at IPO, then maybe you want to spin off like, uh, like a few different services in another language and so on. I mean, that's what's happening at at. at Shopify and GitHub as well, I guess. Yes. Because it's such, every it, it large just... corporation is multi-platform to some yeah. extent. Yeah. And every large corporation realizes that um, certain techniques and approaches that were instrumental for them to become a large organization in the first place might need to be changed at that scale. And that is as it should be. There are no framework, out-of-the-box frameworks or toolkits in the world that work without changes for the biggest um, companies and websites in the world. Everyone from Google to Facebook to whatever, anyone who reaches internet scale will eventually end up building their own tooling because they are at the frontier of what the tooling needs to be able to do. And that is normal and that is good. But you are a sucker if you think that that applies to you when you start your business. You're also a sucker if you think that unless you do that from day one, you can't become one of these things. It's actually the exact opposite. If you start thinking from day one that you need to do all this bespoke work like a Google or Facebook is doing at their scale when you're just one, two, three people and barely have traction, you're never going to fucking get traction 
because you're going to be spending so much time dealing with these fundamental concerns that are just not relevant to your problem space. These are good problems to have. If you get all the way out to the frontier where you need to do some bespoke work yourself because Rails doesn't do this, that, or the other thing, you've won. You have all the money in the world now to do whatever it is you need to do to make those changes. And that's exactly what we're seeing from the likes of Shopify. They can do things like put a whole team on optimizing the virtual machine of Ruby because just squeezing out a couple of percent of efficiency is worth it for them to have several people employed just to do that because they're making so much money because they're a huge company and they became a huge company because in part they were able to get going with Rails. It reminds me of a quote of, um, I think, Sergey Anakin, uh, the CTO of Pipedrive, or now I think co-CEO or something. He said, scaling problems are good problems to have. And uh, yes. I think there's so much truth in this sentence, right? Um, yes. And the, the, the problem is that in history, there have been like a handful of examples or lores or myths, perhaps, because we won't ever really know, where someone thought like, oh, I think the example that was used for a long time was Friendster. Friendster was made in PHP and um, stumbled in part because their technical infrastructure was not able to keep up with their success. Now, the funny thing is that that gets held up as like, oh, be careful what you choose because yeah. you might hit scale <laughs> and then you can't fix it. And PHP is literally the thing running freaking Facebook. The, one of the largest websites in the world. Like they've had to do a bunch of things. They almost invented their own pseudo derivative of the language and blah, blah, blah. But clearly PHP was not the thing that held Facebook back. Friendster got killed because it probably had the wrong architecture. And that's the thing that most people don't want to accept that um, almost all the modern tools, whether you think of JavaScript or Rails or Python or PHP are able to take you all the way from zero to, to Facebook um, if you have the right ar architecture, which the right architecture to some extent is a function of, do you have competent people who understand the problem space that you're dealing with? And sometimes that's not true. Sometimes you don't have people who are competent enough or they don't understand the problem space that they're in and they back themselves up into a corner that it'll take a long time to get out of again. And then, of course, who wants to blame that? Who wants to blame themselves? Yeah, we made mistakes of uh, engineering and architecture and therefore we're in a hole. No, so much better to say like, ah, oh, we just picked, picked the wrong tools. It's the tool's fault. So would you say, or would you advise people to spend more time in problem space? Yes, of course. That uh, especially early on, and especially until you have traction, all the time you spend on the sort of... Um, foundation or, or technical underpinnings or is, is time you're not spending figuring out whether you, you even have an idea that's worth that, right? Um, most ideas, again, don't work. Most businesses don't work. The sooner you can find that out, the better, because then you can move on to something else if it really is a terminally flawed idea. And the sooner you can find that out is by building real software and delivering it to real people and asking, do you want to pay for this? Or at least do you want to use this? And until you get that validation, all the time you spend on Uh, the technical underpinnings, is wasted. So you want a toolkit that's good enough to get you to that answer as quickly as possible, yet will also allow you to go from there to a larger organization. Um, and that is exactly what we've optimized Ruby on Rails to be. The least amount of uh, barriers for you to validate your idea and the full runway to take your idea the whole way if it's good. From my perspective, validation could also sometimes happen like way earlier, like pre-programming actually. Yes. Um, how, how do you think about that? Like the, the idea of product discovery and asking your customers, asking your users, validating your ideas with tools like Figma. Does that make sense? No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I, it was funny. I was about to agree with you, but then you came into essentially offering uh, people fake tools. I don't think that works. I don't think you can ask someone, would you pay for this? Because they're going to tell you yes or no, depending on whether you, they're your friend or not. And mostly they're your friend because those are the people you ask. And they'll say, like, yeah, 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 I could see that. Um, you don't get real answers from the market until you actually ask strangers for their credit card. And strangers is never going to give you the credit card to buy something that does not exist. You have to make something that actually exists, solves a real problem, and is compelling enough that strangers, not your friends, not your acquaintances, will get their credit card out of their pocket and enter it into your web app. And you need to make something real for that to happen. So I am not a believer in essentially a focus group 
uh, validation of ideas. I think many of the best ideas would never have gotten off the ground if you had asked someone, hey, would you pay for this, that, and the other thing? They would have said, no, I want a faster horse, right? Maybe one step back. I mean, obviously, um, friends will always tell you, yes, I would pay for that. Um, so maybe you have like a certain baseline already. Um, let's let's take Basecamp in the very early days and and uh, just repeat the history. Um, like if you had it now with like a certain baseline of customers, would you involve your customers in finding and, and uh, discovering the next steps? Would that make sense? Uh, maybe pre-programming or? No, absolutely not. Um, and I mean, I'm just reflecting here, our approach. You, different people in different domains can do different things. And there are lots of problem domains where the people building it don't know what's good or what's not good or what works or what doesn't work. So they have to ask others. And I have all the respect in the world for that path because holy shit, it's difficult and hard. And if you can in any way, shape or form not be there, if you can put yourself in a place where you're able to validate the quality of what you're building, you're so much better off because it's so much easier. And that's what we've always tried to do. That the V1 the first released version that we do of any product, we build it exclusively for ourselves. Then once we have something real that has an integrity and a vision and we believe is valuable because we would pay for it if someone else had made it, that's the time to hear reactions where people want to go for it because there is already something there. It's already going in a direction. And then you want to hear from customers like, is that the right direction? Maybe you can change it a little and so forth. But I don't think you get valid feedback from customers until they're act interacting with something that's real. So this idea of involving them early on, I think, is a mode that should be reserved exclusively for domains where you don't have any chance of knowing what it's like. You're making software on behalf of other people and you don't have any insight on a personal level into their situation and what they would want. Again, God bless those people. There's important work to be done there. Holy shit, it's difficult. If I would never do that kind of work. I am only interested in doing the kind of work where I have some mode of evaluating whether what I'm building is good or not good. Um, because it's just, uh, yeah, as I say, so much easier. And then you end up with a product that is compelling to at least you, which is more than a lot of software is compelling to, right? A lot of people end up building software that's not even compelling to themselves. They would never have bought that shit if it was made by someone else. Right, they just they have these delusions that oh, I'm I'm building it for someone else, and 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 if I just ask them, then they will come and they will pay. No, they will not. Um, so we follow the path of building a V1 of everything. Build a tight V1, not a V1 that takes five years and has all the bells and the whistles. Build a V1 that's focused around the epicenter of the idea, the core kernel of why this is unique, why someone would want to pay this, and why they would not want to go back to whatever they were doing before once they've experienced your piece of software. That to me is the real test, the real test of whether you have something worth pushing for. Can you find people who, after they've signed up for it, would not want to go back to whatever they were doing to solve the problems that you're trying to solve before? Once you have that, you have people who are happy customers, happy to pay for it, not because they know you, but because they're, you're solving real problems that would be a pain in the ass for them to deal with if they didn't have your software. Um, and you also get more interesting software that way. I think if you look at the history of software created by committees, it's usually kind of shit. It's usually kind of shit because you just take all these inputs and if you don't have an internal cohesive vision for where you want to take it, you end up with like the Homer Simpson car. So the Simpsons had this episode where they said like, yeah, let's ask the common man to design a car and Simpson designs this car and is an absolute monstrosity with all sort of ideas put together and it's just crap, right? I think most good products are created, carved out of a singular vision of a tiny team. And that means saying no to a lot of it's people, a, right? It means saying no to almost everything. And for us, it means not even opening our ears until we have a V1. I don't want to hear what you have to say until we have a V1. Then once we have something out in the market, I want to hear it. I want to hear what didn't work and what was what we mistook our 
uh, interests or proclivities for, for being general and they weren't? Or what's stopping someone else who have a slightly different version of the problems we were trying to solve from using our product? We got tons of feedback once we rolled out Hey. Hey had was missing all sorts of baseline features that many other email clients had because we were focused on the things that made us unique. And then we got feedback. What was the most, of the things we're missing, what's the most important? What's preventing someone from using Hey? And, and we learned a ton from that feedback. But if we had started there, like, what do you want out of an email client? And then we've interviewed 100 people. We would have ended up with the Homer Simpson car of email clients, an absolute monstrosity that no one would have wanted to uh, inflict on their worst enemy. So a lot of technology trends um, are coming in waves. I mean, Rails is a wave or has been a wave like when you, when you launched it initially and like a huge um, new thing on the world that someone actually did good marketing and like uh, connected like a framework with good design and stuff like that. Like it was quite, quite fancy. And um, well, then like a lot of developers also moved over to fancy new stuff such as Alexir, like a lot of people use Node.js um, and Go. Um, what do you think about, about those, let's say, two-year waves? I think this is the nature and nature of everything, that nothing stays on the top of consciousness or hype forever, nor should it. What a boring world it would be if you could just once come up with a solution and then forever and always that would be the thing that governed everything. I love the fact that since Rails, we've had all these alternatives. Because Rails, however good it is, Ruby, however good it is, it's not going to be the thing that fits most people's brain because nothing does. We should be having a uh, an ecosystem of choice where someone goes like, do you know what? Go. Really just fits my brain. This is the language when I think in code, I think in Go. And I go like, oh my God, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy that you found Go and that fits you because this is how I felt when I found Ruby. That Ruby was this unlocking technology that enabled me to go from uh, a mediocre PHP programmer to, to building something of, of real sustaining, lasting value with Rails, with Basecamp, with all the other things we built because Ruby unlocked that in me. I would want for everyone to find that unlocking technology or ecosystem for them. And there's never going to be one that works for everyone. What's interesting though with Waves is like, they come, they crest, and then sometimes they come again. And I think with Rails right now, we are in the resurgent phase where we we had the big wave when it was introduced back in 2004 and then through 2005, six, seven, eight, maybe, um, sort of the bulk and biggest push of, of the hype of it. And then it died down as other things popped up, or whether it was Go or, or Node or these other things. And now enough people have gone through those environments to realize, you know what? Actually, that wasn't for me. I don't want to deal with 5,000 node dependencies. I don't want to deal with the statically typed um, world of Go. Oh, this Ruby thing is still here. <laughs> Actually, oh, that is what I wanted, right? And you didn't know. And now we're having this resurgence where a bunch of people are taking, for, some, for them perhaps, the first look, and in other cases, the second look at something that they dismissed maybe five years ago because at that time, the wave was node, for example. Uh, and now that wave is coming down and more people realize, oh, actually building everything in JavaScript is not sort of, it's not for everyone. Um, and I think that is how it should be. We should have these waves. This is how we get renewal. This is how we get uh, diversity of, of implementations. This is how we get more different sizes of gloves that fits different people's brains just right. I think there's like a certain trend of, um, or I, I hope there will be a certain trend of people moving away um, from um, state on the client side again um, and, and single page web apps um, when they realize, okay, my team is just like split in half and one side tries to do the front end and one side tries to do the back end. Um, I mean, it works out okay-ish if you have one language on front end and back end, but uh, if you don't, then it gets gets complicated, right? And I see like a certain trend that like, at least myself, I, I I remember like the good old times when you just had a, a website um, and you were just producing like content, and it was all request based. Um, you see, you see a trend back to that world again, or you also like are changing rails to adopt the new things, um, or how do you how do you think is is the future there? Yeah, so I've been on those barricades for 
for a long time, that the request response model, the fact that HTML is a really good way of describing uh, web applications and having them having those pages be as free as possible of, of JavaScript is a feature, not a bug. And that the more of the rendering you can push to the server side, the better off you are. And I actually think that the complexity of the sort of single page application and so on is barely mitigated by the fact you use the same language on the front end and the back end. That was the sell that like, oh, now you can use JavaScript both to do your front end and your back end. And it'll be a lot simpler, right? No, no, it didn't. Like that was a that was a hypothesis, and the hypothesis was proven false. It did not get simpler. It get it got horrifically complicated, to to the point where exactly as you say, you needed to be an expert in. Oh, I'm just an expert in the front end. Oh, I'm a, you needed to be, have this dualistic thinking, which totally gets us away from the idea of the one person framework that one individual could build it all without having to study for twenty years to to learn all the intricacies of it. And I think there is a growing sense now. The people are realizing, oh, yeah, actually, why is it that we're creating features so slowly? Why is it that my team need to be this big before we can make any progress? Aren't there better ways of doing it? And in some ways, we're, we're just waiting for the pendulum to swing back and for the initial excitement about what's possible with single-page applications, which was a legitimate excitement. New things were possible, and some applications needed to push that to the max to to really reap the benefits, and then the bulk of everything else didn't. That we ended up making <laughs> static brochure pages out of React, where we go like, what the fuck? What are we doing here? Why are we complicating things to such an... With, with you missing the GraphQL API in the yeah, middle. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Why are we complicating ourselves into such a corner that it now takes this huge team to do these basic things we used to be able to do five minutes ago with one person? I think there's a, a coming realization that like just overshot, which it's also okay. This is how new technology and new excitement works. You, you push it too far into too many places and then you pull back. And now that the pullback is happening, I think more people are open to alternative ideas. And that's the idea that we've been pushing with Rails 7 and Hotwire that there is a way where you can integrate um, the whole thing, make it feel holistic, not dualistic, not splitting things up in the back end and the front end, but making it feel like it's one application, it's one code base um, with as little JavaScript as you can get away with. Um, and you can create applications that are uh, impossible to tell apart. Or the only people who can tell them apart are the industry insider and nitpickers who go like, whoa, well, this was actually HTML that came back rather than JSON. Who gives a fuck? No actual end user gives a fuck. We created hey.com, like an email client, the proverbial example for when you need single page applications. Everyone was like, well, you couldn't build Gmail like that. And we fucking just did, right? We literally built uh, a, an email application that goes head to head with the likes of Gmail using these technologies where when we launch, I forget what it is exactly now, but when we launch, we launch with something like 30 kilobytes of JavaScript. Uh, Gmail takes 4.8 megabytes. Like just in a completely different realm and approach to building something around the same problem. And we signed up tens of thousands of paying users who were thrilled with the application that we had built. So clearly... It was not a requirement that you build with these monstrously complex single-page application frameworks for you to build something that's a compelling alternative to even the likes of Gmail. Um, and I think that opened a lot of people's eyes to the fact that like, oh, if that's possible, if you can literally take on Gmail in email, like mm, I can probably make my application using this as well. Because um, if you rank it in terms of sort of complexity and expectations of UI fidelity and all these other questions, an email client is right up there. It's really up towards the top in terms of the fluidity and how it feels and so forth. And that customers will react to the fact that if you build something slow or that doesn't work well or whatever, they'll just use something else. Um, so if it's possible to build that with 30K of JavaScript, um, clearly it's possible to build 99% of all other applications. Well, not 99%, let's over, not overdo it. Just 95% um, of other applications using these kinds of toolkits. Yeah, I mean, I would say like there are certain cases when you have like a complex wizard or something uh, where you could think about, I don't know, adding know. view no. on top of Rails. <laughs> would, you, would you do that these days? Would you Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'd say um, when the entire interaction is more like Figma, is a good example, perhaps. Mm. Or something else where, like, 
the main interaction and how you shape what you're working with is a UI experience. That's where I go like, okay, fine. That's perhaps not the place where I would pick a hot wire solution to it. Or if you're trying to make, I don't know, Photoshop on the web or, or, or something else like that where um, the UI fidelity is extremely high, um, but a wizard, absolutely not. It falls, I don't even think it's in the top percentile of complexity in terms of asking questions and pe- making people pick between choices. Um, that should be entry stakes. And the funny thing is with that, you don't even need any framework at all, I think, in most cases. When you say complex wizard, that's usually just a worse version of a basic wizard. Yeah, maybe you're right. I mean, a good example, um, I think, is also always, like, if you look at the e-commerce world, and then there's a trend for headless um, shops and and, and front-end frameworks that um, kind of try to... Uh, make use of the backends then, and um, yeah, at a certain point, you 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 should always look at Amazon.com. <laughs> I mean, it's not a single page web app, right? Isn't it? <laughs> so Amazon.com, basically, technology wise and front end wise, is the same as it's been since like ninety nine. Yeah, and it's it's just a great example to to right. get people back from the. Oh, um, I'm, yes. I'm I'm I potentially have to use the same stuff that Google uses or something like that. Um, right. So why don't you build an operating system for SaaS um, out of Rails? I mean, Laravel, I think, is, is doing it in a way. They, they are building components like, like Active Admin and Rails and uh, payment components. And in, in Rails, there's like Jumpstart Rails where you can do like essentially a similar thing. Why don't you uh, like accept Rails as your, your full-time thing and uh, just start over um, and just make it make it more attractive than it is for developers. Um, if you compare it to, to Laravel, for example, you could catch up easily. Why don't you do that? First and foremost, because it doesn't interest me. And secondarily, because I don't think it would be as good. I think Rails is as good as it is because it is forged from the problems of the real world. That the main thing I'm building is real applications I actually have to sell to disinterested strangers. And I have to build really good applications to do that. And that is the the forge of the real world that is leading to all the interesting ideas that we've been able to come up with in Rails, in my opinion. That um, all of the work that's gone into Rails have been from meeting real life problems and trying to come up with solutions to those real life problems. Um, and then sharing those those solutions. And do you know what? I'm just not I'm not interested in in solving these other problems. And in fact, I also have a tendency to think that when sort of the framework maker does something like that, it creates a de facto monopoly that I don't think is actually healthy at all. That it is better for us to have a jump start and five other alternatives to that that's implemented by someone who's not operating the framework. Um, and have the competition that happens within that. Now, that doesn't take anything away from Laravel. It doesn't take anything away from anyone else who tries to take a different path. I have full respect for that. I think it's wonderful that that's happening as well. Um, It's just not what I'm interested in. I would absolutely be miserable if I had to work on Rails full time. I love the fact of extracting things into Rails. I love the working on Hay and finding like five new major problem spaces that we could solve in Rails in a generic way that would work for any application that has to deal with the fundamental pl- plumbing that we've had to solve for Hay. So for example, for Hay, um, handling inbound email processing, that is a generic plumbing problem that any application can take advantage of if they need to handle inbound email, whether they're building an email client like or an email platform like, uh, like Hay or they're building something else. Those kinds of problems have my interest the other thing is that I tend to find that when the closer the components get to the front end, they start dictating how the application looks and feels. And I am absolutely allergic to frameworks dictating how the application should look or feel. So for me, there's a very tight line uh, I don't want to cross where you can tell that something is a Rails application. I don't want like the the user management system or the login system or so on to be able to tell that it is. Now, that has happened to some degrees in some corners because there are popular gems like device and others that are trying to solve these solutions. And that's fine. I, I, 
I admire that, and that's great that it happens. But um, it's not something I use. It's not something we use. We use uh, we make it from the the foundation every time. Um, I don't want to start with a, a, a pre baked shake and and bake package here that has some impact on what the final product tastes like. I want to work on plumbing that is generally applicable to all applications of of all kinds, regardless of how they, they look. So some of that, I mean, is both what I think is right for Rails and also what I, I am interested in and, and what I want to pursue. Um, again, that being said, I think it's awesome what they've been able to do with Laravel. And I think it's fun to see different frameworks and ecosystem pick different paths. We shouldn't all have the same line. That would be boring as hell. If we're all just clones of each other, what's the fun in that? I am happy that Rails and how we've chosen to solve some of the fundamental problems have provided such a depth of inspiration for these other frameworks. And then they've been able to take it in other directions, right? That uh, a lot of how frameworks like Laravel and others have been able to take like, oh, Rails has solved some fundamental issues about how to do, let's take that, let's translate that into the PHP way of doing it. And then let's build some other things on top of it and let's focus on some other things. Wonderful. That is how the open source community is supposed to work, that we all get inspired by each other and we copy some things from there and then they copy some things over here and then we end up with all these mutations. And someone can look at those mutations and go like, you know what? That one, that's the one I want. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of inspiration happening, I guess, back and forth, but um, like the, the hot wire approach also recently popped up in the in the PHP world there. And I think it's just great. I mean, if you want to use PHP, I, I wouldn't. I don't like the the, the backslash <laughs> in the namespaces, but um and, and a lot of other things, obviously. But if you want, you can have something very similar to Rails, which is which has a, a good design um these days. Um that simply wasn't possible like 10 years ago, right? So um, yes, and I think it's also important to go that we can collaborate across ideas that aren't tied to PHP. Hotwire is a good example, that there's implementations and integrations for Hotwire, for Django, for Laravel, for all sorts of other uh, frameworks, because, do you know what, we can still collaborate on some of these other things, and we can go, um, hey, we can we can share some stuff here. This is also why Hotwire isn't just a part of Rails, because Hotwire is more generally applicable than just Rails or just Ruby, that these are ideas about how to tackle the problems on the front end that are not tied to what you are using on the back end. And I I like that. I like that sense that like, you know what? I like PHP. I want to work with PHP. And I can still use Hotwire. I can still use some of these other things that come out of the, the Ruby on Rails world. So... Like just briefly touching the the, the frontend world once more. Um, in Rails six, there was something called Webpacker, um, and that was essentially trying to to combine the best of both worlds and um, like offer you the opportunity to bundle all your JavaScript stuff with with your Rails app. To be honest, like you 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 pushed me away with that a bit. Like it was always hard to to manage and to understand. Um, what what your stack is doing and it was slow like terribly slow and people just hated it w- was that a mistake or i think it was a clutch that was necessary at the time the alternative to saying do you know what rails is not going to have any answer for anyone who wants to do anything with modern javascript was a non-starter in my book it, it wouldn't have worked for us we wouldn't have been able to build hey we wouldn't have been able to build basecamp we wouldn't have been able to do any of the things that we wanted to do um, but I had to hold my nose too. I created Webpacker to create this integration and make it as nice as possible. And it wasn't particularly nice. It was a compromise for a moment in time when the underlying technologies just weren't good enough. And now the underlying technologies have improved dramatically. Um, Rails 7, the focus of that has been embracing those fundamental improvements from HTTP 2, such that we don't need bundling anymore, to... Uh, the fact that uh, ES6 is now available in all modern browsers, to the fact that import maps is the most promising new web standard that that I've seen in a long time that frees us from transpiling, have conspired all those three things together to enable this radical simplification for how you build a, a Rails application together with modern JavaScript. Because in my book, sort of just the abstinence approach was never realistic. It was never realistic to say like, well, Rails just won't deal with that. The, the modern JavaScript world is too hard and we, we, we just can't do it. So you're on your own. 
you have to figure out what you want to do, or you have to create two code bases. You create a Rails app with a with a backend API, and then you create another code base with a node based front end. That seemed like shit too. We were forced to pick between bad choices, and in my book, we picked the least bad choice. But now that the technology has advanced, it was still a bad choice. And even as a creative webpack, I was thrilled to retire it. I was thrilled and so happy when I yanked it out of Basecamp. So happy when I yanked it out of Hay. Um, and what we've been that, able yeah. to replace it with is a truly magnificent step forward. This combination, you have the de- new default in Rails 7 where we use import maps, where you don't have any node installed at all, that you get to use the latest, greatest of the JavaScript world without even installing node on your machine and all the complexity that comes with that is something I'm tremendously proud of. I think we've really taken an enormous step forward and I'm seeing that the fight against the complexity that comes from sort of smashing node together with all these environments is something that's spreading that, uh, I think in Elixir, they also yanked out the node, uh, thing and, and went with, uh, ES build, which is a single, um, executable that includes everything you need to do this compilation. Other environments are starting to do the same thing. Even within the the um, sort of ecosystem around Node, you take something like Tailwind CSS, which used to require that you install it as a Node setup and you had to have all the machinery to do that. You can now get as a single executable. So that again, you can get to use Tailwind without having Node installed in your system. You sidestep an entire class of problems which is the kind of advancement in framework development that gets me most excited. Conceptual compression. You take something that used to be very difficult and then you compress the, all the complexity out of it without removing capability. That is bliss. It doesn't happen very often, but it's happened in Rails 7 when it comes to the JavaScript approach. And um, hey, so hey.com runs in this whole new approach. There's no node involved. There is import maps. There is letting the browser run the JavaScript as it comes out of, of, the, of the text editor with no transpiling. Um, and yet still, we can pull in packages as we need them from NPN because we're using essentially the cloud compiling that is modern day JavaScript CDNs. Um, it's such a sigh of relief. I'm really happy that we're over that phase. But if I had to wind the clock back to 2015 and look at the same problem space, okay, either you can choose the path of abstinence, see the entire um, modern JavaScript world and say like Rails is just not going to deal with that, or hold our nose a little bit, deal with some of the clunky integration that was required to make it work at the time. Yeah, I would still pick holding my nose and being realistic um, about what was needed to create the base cams, the haze of the world, um, and then just biding my time. When can we yank out this complexity? Because even building up all this stuff, using all this stuff, I mean, my resentment against the complexity re- uh, required never receded. I, I cursed at the complexity of setting up Webpack and the configurations and all the stuff that came with it. And I would learn it and I would get good at it. And then I'd be away from it from a couple of months and I'd come back and I'd go like, what the hell even what is happened this? Here? Yeah. What <laughs> happened here, right? Um, and, and you need like a new dependency management yes. or some new- Just shoot me now. tool. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled. If, if I didn't have to ever install Node again on my development machine, I would be a happy camper. So that reminds me of like a, a picture of a New York Times headline a, f- a few days ago that someone um, used to build a meme um, it was Europe thinks Putin is planning something even worse than war. He's making a JavaScript bundler. <laughs> <laughs> it, the funny thing is that, I mean, it seems like most people, at least unless they're actually involved with making JavaScript bundlers, hate JavaScript bundlers. Um, but I mean, let's also give it some credit, right? I, it, this is what I think is important here is that like we're in a better place now because of that. We went through an absolutely awkward and awful phase where the complexity required to make use of this tooling was just ludicrous. But now we've ended up on the other side of that with all the advantages and benefits of modern JavaScript. Again, I don't want to go back to 2007 and write ES3 
That was a really shit version of JavaScript that I had no love for whatsoever. Um, in fact, I, we used uh, CoffeeScript for many years, just trying to cope with the awfulness that was ES3 and earlier, right? And then you come out and you use a modern version of JavaScript and you go like, do you know what? This is actually pretty nice. You use ESM and, and that whole modeling system, you go like, this is pretty nice. It's not my favorite language in the world. That's still Ruby, but you know what? It's probably in my top five. I, I'm not repulsed anymore by writing JavaScript. I, I can even occasionally enjoy it because the tooling and the language has improved to the point that like, it is now an enjoyable experience now that we've gotten rid of the complexity. And looking at import maps once more, does that, like, is it applicable for, for banks or companies that are very scared uh, around GDPR issues and so on? I mean, I remember like a few days ago, uh, there has been like a lot of talks about um, uh, like, are, are Google fonts uh, okay to, to, to embed and to require from, from a remote source? Uh, how do you think about that? Is that... Yes, I think it's irrelevant because import maps do not require you to use the CDN. So you can just download. This is actually what we've done with Hey. Hey does not use an external source. We download everything um, and we use the CDN as a cloud compiler. We use the CDN as a way of getting, I want this version of this library. And then you download it to your app and you check it in mm -hmm. as a vendor dependency. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I probably say I was excited about the JavaScript CDNs for a moment. And I think still think there's something to it. But I don't think it offers enough um, advancement. Um, I think the advancement is in cloud compilation, that there's a computer somewhere on the web that can produce a finished compiled version of the package that I want, and I can just download that. It's almost like um, the JavaScript world for a while was like, what was it called? Was it called Gen 2, the Gen 2 Linux distribution where you download just a source and then like, yeah, um, I'll be ready to go in 18 hours because I got to <laughs> compile the whole thing. It was like, why are we all compiling from source? Can't I just use the, the finished packages? And I think that's what the JavaScript CDNs essentially offer. They offer a way so that you can download the final compilated output and you can slot that into your application. You can serve it directly to the browser. Um, so that's what import maps does for me that we get to use the cloud compiler so that we don't need to install all the heavy machinery on our own machines. Um, we get to integrate those libraries with our own JavaScript. We get to use it as though we were writing a quote unquote normal node application where we can depend on, on these packages and we can use them in a, in a modern way. And it requires no transpiling. It requires no bundling. We shed all of the complexity that goes with it, and we're just serving direct individual files to the browser, and the browser understands it. That is um, just tremendous complexity compression. Um, it's interesting. I mean, also in the Rails history, there have been so many topics that um, like increased. Like you first thought, okay, this this helps me, and then at a certain point you just understood yeah okay um with modern technology it in a way increases uh, um the 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 complexity by a lot and then it went away right again yes. right like form builders for example i don't know if you use them these days no yeah never did simply, but um i think coffee script is a good example there too right that coffee script was a way of trying to cope with the fact that javascript used to be not a very nice language right then CoffeeScript comes in, adds a substantial amount of complexity to it to make something that is a, in a moment of time necessary. And then it stops being necessary. And I, I don't look back at uh, CoffeeScript as a mistake. I look back and like, that was great. For like a handful of years, or it made time, JavaScript yeah. um, more palpable to, to people who had to write it. And then it was no longer necessary. It served its purpose. We should applaud it. I feel the same way about Webpacker and Rails. Like, I'm happy that it existed for the time it needed to, and I'm happy to see it go. This is part of why the art of framework building is never done, because the fundamental tectonic plates keep shifting. HTTP2 was a huge leap forward in terms of how we think about how we can send assets, right? Like you used to compile everything. We used to compile images even. Remember sprites? Where you would have like, oh, I, I need 46 icons. I don't want them all to be 46 individual openings of HTTP requests and so on. I can just ship a single sprite. It was 
annoyingly complicated. Then you had to use CSS to figure, oh, I need the sprite that's at that location times that location. HTTP comes in and essentially makes it free to send 10 files versus one file. And you're like, oh, huh, don't need sprites anymore. Don't need bundling in most cases. Not only do we not need those things, we get to a place that's better. When you send 10 individual files, you have 10 individual files that run on their own cache expiration timeline. So the nine files that never change and haven't changed in two years can be cached, cached literally forever. And the file that keeps churning doesn't invalidate all the others. So um, that's the fun part for me of being in web development after 20 years is that we occasionally manage to make the fundamentals better to the point that things get simpler not more complicated, which is otherwise what's happening a lot of the times where we just manage to make things more complicated without any discernible benefit to the end user or even the programmer who has to wrestle with it. Yeah, interesting. Um, slowly coming to the outro questions, um, do you have any tool or tools you right now recommend to all of your, your geeky friends, I would say? Is there anything special? You mean end user stuff or programmers? well, yeah, end user or let's say techie end user, um, nerdy end user. Anything that makes you more productive these days? Um, it's funny because some of these recommendations are throwbacks. I'm still a huge fan of TextMate. So TextMate was a, a text editor on the Mac that I was involved in the early development of. Uh, back in 2005, I think the first version came out. And then that went through also a little bit of a phase where there's a lot of excitement for a while and then other things came out and people started using other or other editors. When I look at some of those things like VS Code, for example, I've given it a good go and go like, do you know what? Yeah, I don't, don't like it, not better. Um, so sometimes I'd recommend people to take up just things that have existed for a long time, like TextMate, or there are other people in the same realm who like, they love Vim, right? Like, even though Vim's been around for, what is now, 30 years, 40 years. Um, that's their thing. I think diving into the archives is is interesting in a way that just finding the latest new, new thing is is not. Because the latest new, new thing, you can't avoid hearing about. Like it's at the top of Hacker News, it's at the top of everything. So diving back into the archives and finding the things that have stood the test of time and trying to learn those, I think is interesting. Um, it's the same thing with literature. You find a book that's still around 2,000 years later or 2,500 years later, and you go like, you know what? There's probably some value here <laughs> because most um, tools, techniques, wisdom, knowledge does not stand the test of time. Most get swept away quite quickly. So when you find things that have stood the test of time, it's worth looking into it and figuring out why, why it's still here. And... How do you stay productive these days? Like any recent learnings that you had um, that that like improved your your productivity overall? Single biggest improvement that I've done to my productivity over the past ten years have been to reduce my use of Twitter by ninety seven percent. That is ninety seven exactly. <laughs> ninety seven exactly. That is the greatest not just productivity hack, but uh, mental well-being and life hack that I can recommend to anyone. Um, the current modern state of social media is uh, a mass psychosis that is just playing out every day from morning till night. And the fact that we all, to a later, greater extent, um, show up and participate in that is just truly tragic. And um, That has really just been just a huge sort of just cloud lifting. And I say that as someone who we're not just a user of, but a very active participant in these um, arenas for a very long time. And while I'd like to be able to point back at moments in time of that and go like, oh, we did something that was good here. We did something that was good here. We advanced this cause or that cause. I've come to look at the totality of it with a substantial amount of regret. And like, do you know what? If I tallied all the hours I spent arguing with strangers on Twitter over the past decade, do you know what? Um, I could have been a substantially happier person plowing that time into fucking knitting or, or some other endeavor that uh, did not involve shouting with strangers on a fucking platform um, day in and day out. So looking back upon that and going like, do you know what? Um, that's the thing I... I have very few regrets in life, I'd say. 
not often I look back and like, oh man, um, I wish I would have done something different. If only I could have told my former self about this thing, I could have avoided it. Very, very few things on that list, but I'm increasingly coming to the conclusion that my participation in Twitter in particular might qualify. What about reading news? I mean, also with 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 COVID and the pandemic, there's like a lot yes. of... Yes, again, tremendous waste of time. The amount of time I used to, or I spent following every minute change in COVID numbers or infections or whatever, you look back upon that as like, did that change anything? Did my behavior become substantially different? Did I avoid some sort of major catastrophe by constantly being up to date on it? No, I didn't. It was an indulgence in much the same way as um, people used to ridicule folks for watching daytime television, right? They'd be like, ha, 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 the average American watches five hours of daytime television. And now you see these reviews of mobile phones and people go like, ah, you can only get six or seven hours of screen on time. That's not even enough for a whole day. You're like, wait, wait, fuck, what? You're on your fucking device for five, six, seven hours a day. That's why there's not enough battery in this a uh, nefarious machine to to make it through. That is just a catastrophe of of human potential and life and spirit that's getting sucked into these devices. I think that's a that's a real tragedy. Um, and I was there, is there to a large extent. I'd like to further reduce my consumption of vapid news. That, and I mean vapid in, in the most literal sense. It literally evaporates like the next day. That was just not a relevant thing. And I contrast that with time spent, for example, reading books. A book has to be really shitty for me to go like, you know what? That was a total waste of time. And I wish I would have spent that time reading, scrolling my Twitter feed instead. Almost no books that I've read have ever qualified for that level of condemnation. And most books I read, even if they're just mediocre books, I actually remember something of them. And I think back on them and they change my perspective and an entire argument is allowed to unfold. And I go like, this was good. Yeah. The other one I'd say, which is a more of a modern resurgence, is newsletters. I'm a huge fan of email newsletters, um, both in terms of writing them, which I've started doing now that I... I've cut myself off from using Twitter as a mode of expression. I've plowed that creative uh, energy into writing long form in terms of email newsletters. And I found like, you know what? This is better. Like it's better for me to produce this and it's also better for me to consume this. Um, my favorite form of, of consumption of sort of opinion and so on is email newsletters where single individuals, often on Substack kind of dominates this um, arena, um, put out something like a few times a week, maybe. And I hear from what, five, six, seven people through that rather than the cacophony of hundreds of people every day on Twitter. I think part of it is that uh, quantity is its own quality and sometimes a negative quality, that the quantity of strangers you hear from on scrolling through Twitter is like, I don't think our brains were built for that. Yeah, that's good. That's, um, yeah, really, I, I see myself also sometimes like scrolling through it and it's yeah just a waste of time, but. I, it's worse there, like, than a waste of time. That's actually my point. So um, TikTok is another thing that I've like, so TikTok has been this big thing, right? And I was like, all right, you know what? I, I sort of, I want to be informed. I want to, so I've signed up for TikTok and used it a fair bit actually. And TikTok, I'd say at least we all get a different algorithmic feed, right? But the algorithmic feed that I've been fed is is often jokes about whatever, corporate life or being married or funny kids or or kittens or, or something else like that. And after I've spent like half an hour on TikTok, I go like, that was a waste of time in its most literal sense that like that time just disappeared. I vaguely <laughs> remember a single clip I watched. I might have watched over, if you do half an hour of TikTok, you I don't know what the average before you scroll, there's everything. You might have watched a few hundred clips, right? I might remember one or two of them. I'm like, it's almost like a memory hole where you just go into your brain and just like, let's erase this half hour. That's a waste of time. Twitter is worse. It's not just a waste of time. It just doesn't take that half hour away from you. It leaves you Bad angry, yeah. uh, resentful, depressed. All the worst emotions you can sort of inflict on someone um, is what Twitter at least modern day Twitter, didn't used to be this to this extent. It was probably always a version of this, but we've, the algorithm has now over 10 years grinded away until 
the vast majority of what's on Twitter is this angry, resentful, bitter exchanges of tribalism. Um, and you go like, do you know what? This is worse than wasting my time. This is actively making it worse. Like mm. Life. Mm. Absolutely. Um, like uh, when you when you were talking about TikTok, I, I like kind of felt reminded of my TikTok experience. Um, and actually Futurama, you know, those, those brain snakes that <laughs> uh, you just stick to your head and then they suck out your brain. And in a way, it, it, it feels like that, right? Um, it does. And it, what's fascinating about it is... Um, it's enjoyable in the moment. Like TikTok is funny. There's a bunch of funny stuff on it and there's a bunch of clever stuff on it. And there's a bunch of impressive stuff on it. But so you can sit in the moment and you're scrolling and, and whatever. It's very addictive too. Um, and then afterwards, you just left with this empty feeling. This was like totally empty calories. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing in it here. It's like the difference between eating like chips and rye bread, Right. Like the, the chips, there's nothing in it. There's nothing, there's no nutrients of, this is a little bit of an overstatement. I don't think it's true in all cases, but um, my experience of, experience of it is like after that half an hour of use, you could just go like, what did I even watch? I can't even fucking remember half of it. It's like a brain hack in that sense. And I think there's, there's reason to be sort of like, is this good? I'm not sure this is good. Um, suspicious of it, but I think the judge is somewhat out on like, what are the long-term ramifications? And so on. I think the, the, the verdict is in on Twitter and where that takes us, where it takes the, the natural conversation and so on. And what's really interesting to observe is that in the US, Twitter dominates and sets the political agenda. Things that trend on Twitter and so on, like they directly influence almost the next minute, the political coverage and so on. So Twitter has really um, captured the political discussion in the U.S. You look at other countries and it's not true. The political discussion in Denmark is not captured by Twitter. Twitter does not set the agenda for the next day because there's a much stronger media for whatever reason, Danes are less um, likely to engage in and so on. But then you look in on individual Danish politicians, for example, they'll tweet something out and you look at like what the replies are and the replies are just as shit. They're just as angry, resentful, whatever. So you go like, no society is actually immune to this. Like this is getting sucked out, but what's different is like the, the place in the society that this fucking hellhole takes up. Um, and in some societies like the U.S., it takes up an enormous part. Like it's an institution that really sets the agenda. And in other societies like the Danish, for example, I don't know how it is in other places. These are the two realms I follow the most. It's just this tiny little thing on the side. And you go like, which would you rather have? Would you rather have that this resentful, angry, bitter hellhole is dominating the political discussion? Or would you rather have that it's a small minority part of it? It's pretty clear to me that you would rather have it to be as small of a minority of it as it could possibly be. Thank you, David. So <laughs> I won't ask the time machine question today. <laughs> you already answered it. Um, thanks a lot for, for, for spending time with us and uh, for the like, exciting thoughts and, and ideas. Um, hope to, to, to catch up there in the future and, and meet again. Uh, thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye.